and welcome to RAP's webinar. My name is Janine Migden Ostrander, and I'm with I'm a principal with RAP. Um, I want to start off by welcoming all of you to this webinar. We have a lot of attendees. Um, just so that you know some basic housekeeping issues first is that we're recording today's session and we'll send you a link to the recording and the presentation materials. Uh, since we have close to 400 registrants, we're asking you to please keep your phone lines muted during the webinar so as to um, not have any interference um, with, with the presentation. And we thank you for that. If you have questions, please submit them through the question pane. You should see a question pane on your screen, and we will get those questions and try to get them answered. Um, after there, there will be two presenters today, Jim Lazar and Wilson Gonzalez. And after each pre uh, presentation, we will ask simply for clarifying questions, which are which we're asking you, please, if there's something in the presentation you don't understand or was not clear, to ask those questions. More discussion-related questions will come after both presentations. Um, we will hold, and so we will hold all those other questions for after the webinar. Um, so. Um, with that, um, I would like to um, start off by thanking Heisen Simon Foundation for funding this project. Um, we, this project was, was quite an extensive one for us. We started off by creating a questionnaire in which we interviewed a number of um, stakeholders and experts across the industry. And they consisted of some commissioners, utilities, consumer advocates, energy service providers, and other industry experts. We interviewed them to get their views and opinions to help us, to help inform us for this paper. And the subjects that we covered with them included rate design and policy preferences, net metering, smart meters, distributed generation, rate design, and electric vehicles. So our paper then goes on to, uh, to incorporate a lot of the comments that we got, which were very helpful and for which we, we thank the participants. And we then um, talk about a lot of smart rate designs, but also we cover some of the pitfalls of some of the more regressive rate designs like straight fixed variable. So welcome again to the webinar. Our two speakers are Jim Lazar. Uh, Jim is based in Olympia, Washington, and has maintained a consulting practice in electric and gas, and natural gas, utility rate making, and resource planning since 1982. His clients have included municipal and cooperative electric utilities, natural gas utilities, regulatory commissions, state consumer advocates, and public interest organizations in the U.S. and Canada. Mr. Lazar is the principal author of handbooks and articles on rate design, renewable energy integration, consumer participation in the electric industry planning, integrated resource planning, and incentive regulation. He has assisted RAP since 1998 working on projects around the world. Our second speaker will be Wilson Gonzalez, who is the president of Treehouse Energy and Economics Consulting, where he provides consulting services on utility cases. Prior to working at Treehouse, he served as a senior energy policy advisor for the Office of the Ohio Consumers Council and has over 29 years of experience in the energy community, including extensive knowledge in energy efficiency, rate design, renewable energy, and smart grid issues. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez received a bachelor's degree in economics from Yale University and a master's degree in economics from the University of Massachusetts. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Jim Lazar to begin his presentation. Oh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. This paper, which I hope you've downloaded from our website or will after this webinar is done, focuses on three guiding principles of, of rate design. First, that a customer should be able to connect to the grid for no more than the cost of connecting to the grid. And we'll see what that means. Second, that customers should pay for power supply and for grid services based on how much they use and when they use it. And third, that customers supplying power to the grid should receive full and fair compensation, no more and no less. So I'll start with the first principle, that a customer should be allowed to connect to the grid for no more than the cost of connecting to the grid. Here we have a picture of a grid from power stations through transmission, distribution, and eventually reaching customers. When we talk about connecting to the grid, we're talking about those customer-specific facilities 
that are added and subtracted as an individual customers uh, become uh, active on, on the grid, not the entire grid behind that. The second, customers should pay for the grid in proportion to how much they use the grid and when they use the grid. A very large suburban house uses more grid services. There's fewer customers per pole mile, the kilowatt hours are higher, the kilowatts are higher than a studio apartment where there may be 300 customers uh, connected to the grid at a single point of connection through a single transformer bank. Second, part of this principle is the customers pay for that power when they use it. And we, most of us leave our refrigerator on all day and all night. Refrigerators have a very level usage pattern. Those of us with air conditioners turn them on when it's hot. Air conditioners are very peak oriented. And customers that have electric vehicles uh, have the ability to control when they charge those vehicles and may be able to take advantage of lower cost periods and may also be able to provide services to the grid, as Wilson will discuss later. And finally, the customers delivering power to the grid should receive what it's worth. That may be a very different amount from the retail rate. It could be much greater than or somewhat less than the retail rate. When we boil all of this down into paper to rate design, it comes out to you know, an, an illustrative residential rate with a monthly charge for billing and collection. Uh, it might be maybe $4 a month. Uh, a demand charge that covers just the final line transformer, not the rest of the grid. And that might be a dollar a KW or a KVA per month. And then a time varying rate for power supply and distribution with off-peak, mid-peak, on-peak, and ideally critical peak periods in that rate design. It's an illustrative rate design, but it's a guide to what we think is a sensible rate design for the future. But many utilities are uh, advocating high fixed charges in the rate designs. And where the question is, where did the idea that high fixed charges and electric rates are appropriate come from? Well, it comes out of the electric utility cost of service study. And it depends entirely on what assumptions are made uh, in preparing the study, particularly at the classification stage, where things are divided between energy demand and customer related costs, and most specifically, which costs are treated as customer related. There are several different methodologies used in cost studies. One that has appeared recently is being called the straight fixed variable methodology, where all of the cost of the distribution system is classified as customer related. And the analyst concludes that every customer should pay a substantial monthly fee for access to the grid. A common method used by some rural electric cooperatives, the minimum system method, measures what would the cost be for a minimum size distribution system. And typically about half of the distribution system is classified as customer related in that approach. And in my experience, the most common method used by regulators, state regulators for investor-owned utilities is called the basic customer method, where only the customer-specific facilities are classified as customer related. That's a method that we think is probably appropriate for the utility of the future. If we compare the results of these methods, the straight fixed variable method, assigning poles and wires and transformers and services and meters and billing and customer service, on a per customer basis may produce a, a monthly charge over $40 a month. The minimum system method may be 25. The basic customer method perhaps as little as $4 a month. All of these are methods. The question is what is the best method for the electric utility being examined? But we really need to, electric utility regulation was created to impose on utilities the discipline that competition imposes on industries that have competition. So how do other industries handle fixed cost recovery? Oil refineries have billions of dollars of fixed costs and they recover those costs one gallon at a time. 
airlines have billions of dollars of fixed costs, and they recover those one seat at a time. Billion dollar resort hotels have massive fixed costs, and they recover them one room at a time. So when we take all of this together, uh, our, our paper basically concludes that if customers are paying on the basis of usage in these time periods, the off-peak rates will generally recover the cost of baseload generation plus the transmission and distribution to get to customers. The mid-peak rates will reflect the cost of intermediate generation, such as combined cycle gas, plus the transmission and distribution to get that to the customers. The on-peak rates will recover the cost of peaking generation and distribution, but because peaking units are usually built near the loads, they don't need transmission uh, to get to the load center. And finally, the critical peak period would most logically be served with demand response resources that don't need uh, any transmission or distribution. I'm now going to turn to the subject of, of uh, homegrown electricity, uh, mostly photovoltaic systems. The solar customer is a little different kind of customer. At night, they're a retail customer taking power from the utility. During the daytime, they may produce more than they need and export power uh, to the utility. This creates interesting challenges in rate design, and we think that the approach that we've put together addresses it pretty responsibly. It's important to know that all kilowatt hours are not equal. And we'll take an example here of a community farm stand uh, that sells local organic tomatoes for $3 a pound and trucked in tomatoes from a distance for $2 a pound. Clearly two different kinds of tomatoes. But they're offering to buy the local organic tomatoes for $2 a pound. So the wholesale price of the superior product, the local organic tomato, it happens to be exactly the same as the retail price of the grid tomato, the trucked in tomato. Just by happenstance, those prices happen to be the same. Different participants in the rate making process look at the uh, issue of, of service to solar customers differently. And the traditional rate making view of how rates are set, the utility's average cost of service on the left is uh, equal to the retail rates on, on the right, and the utility receives enough revenue to recover its cost of service. A critical view of net metering that we see from, from some utilities uh, is that the lost revenues from net metering substantially outweigh the avoided short-run fuel and purchase power costs that result from solar being fed into the grid. And while that's a legitimate short-run perspective, uh, it may not be the best long-run perspective. On the other side of the scale, solar advocates say, wait, the solar resource is not only providing long-run avoided costs for generation and transmission and distribution, but also reduced emissions, avoided fuel cost risk, fuel supply risk, local economic development, avoiding future carbon costs, providing shading benefits that reduce air conditioning loads, and much, much more. Uh, a more balanced view, in, in, as our paper examines it, is to compare the utility's average cost of service that makes up the rates to the long-run avoided cost that the utility actually experience its generation, transmission, distribution, those emission costs that are uh, incurred by the utility and avoided a renewable portfolio standard obligation if the utility has one, fuels cost risk and fuel supply risk that are borne by the rate payer. Now, you know, this shows it as balanced. We've looked at a number of value of solar studies. Uh, that look at the short run or long run value of solar measuring the economic values to the utility system and compare that on the right to the average per kilowatt hour retail rate in the US. The value of solar are in the same ballpark as the average rate. Uh, that means 
from perspective of our study that if you have a good value of solar study uh, that looks at all of the economic values, that may be a good basis for compensation to the solar customer. If not, the retail rate, traditional net metering, is unlikely to significantly overcompensate the solar customer. So with that, I'm going to stop for a moment for uh, any clarifying questions on this before I hand it off to Wilson to talk about uh, the remainder uh, of, of the, the technical issues in this paper. Jim, we did have one, thank you Jim for the presentation, we did have one clarifying question which was a questioner asked about how much would the $1 per kVA per month transformer demand charge amount to for the average residential solar customer per month? About $7 a month would, for a single family customer uh, would, would be pretty typical. Uh, and, and maybe 3 or $4 a month for an apartment customer and maybe as much as $15 a month for a very large uh, uh, McMansion type home. Thank you. And there was one other question that just came in, which was, can you expand further on distribution of water cost, what you meant there? Uh, utilities incur capacity costs for substations, for distribution circuits, uh, and, and for, for line transformers. And when loads are lower or when loads are being served by local generation, the line losses uh, at the distribution level can be dramatically reduced. Uh, and so those are the, the primary avoided distribution costs. And then one final question, um, and then we'll go on to Wilson's presentation, is is the dollar per kVA similar uh, to the commercial demand charges? No, it is not, and uh, because we believe that both on the commercial side and on the residential side, the uh, upstream distribution circuit costs and, and so forth should be recovered in time varying energy prices, uh, not through demand charges. Demand charges should be limited to those capacity elements that are customer specific. Okay, we've got a number of other questions that have come in, but I'm going to hold these other questions for the Q&A at the end of Wilson's presentation. Um, matter of fact, we've gotten quite a few other questions. So I'm going to, we'll turn it over now to Wilson Gonzalez, who's going to continue the presentation. Thank you. Wilson? Yes. Welcome. At RAT, we're excited about the smart technologies that are being developed and deployed in the field. These technologies, when married to smart rate designs through smart meters, have the potential to lower total system costs and customer bills while increasing system while increasing system reliability. Rate design should empower smart technologies such as smart thermostats, energy management systems, water heater controls, ice storage as a substitute for air conditioning, and battery storage like Tesla's new power wall introduced this year. We note in the paper that in Germany, one in three PV installations this year are projected to have battery storage. Next. Next. One technology with great promise is the electric vehicle. It can be a source of on peak power through vehicle to grid applications. Smart charging technologies can charge at night, creating a market for off peak power. That can help mitigate utility revenue erosion. Also, ancillary services provide a valuable function to the grid that include voltage regulation, power factor control, frequency control, and spinning reserves to match power supply and demand instantaneously. So, what is, this path, what is the path to a smart electric future? No, it's not a brain, a heart, and courage, although we will need all three of the elements. If the great Wizard of Oz were alive today, for the younger audience, I don't mean Dr. Oz. If the great Wizard of Oz were alive today, he would grant us, number one, cost-effective deployment of smart meter and smart grid. Number two, smart, smart rates. And finally, enabling technology. Next. 
First, smart meters will enable detailed data acquisition and control communications capability. Smart meters are projected to reach 91% saturation by 2022. However, meter data management systems are critical. Today, or together, you can interface with the new building engine to develop smart and dynamic pricing options. Therefore, smart meters coupled with meter data management systems represents the brains of the future power grid. Next. With respect to distributive generation, bidirectional smart meters are key when tracking power flows and important when considering solutions to the current net metering debate. And we'll see that later. Next. Second, smart rates are critical to unleashing smart technology. This graph highlights the risk-reward profiles of different rate Next. This table summarizes the different rates that appeared in the prior graph, ranging from a single average rate to a real-time pricing rate. Next. There exists considerable evidence that smart rates can reduce system costs and customer bills. The Brattle Group's quote-unquote skyline bar chart, bar chart, a smart rate pilot is presented on the slide that shows the savings achieved by the different rate designs. Next. Third, smart rates work best when enabling technology. It can be as easy as using a smartphone app, as depicted above, to respond to utility price signals. Next. I ask for your patience and indulgence concerning the next two slides that highlight the importance of enabling control technologies, such as automated controls, as quoted in a recent DOE report. I know how eyes can get glazed when reading quotes, but this one is thought provoking. Next. The takeaway from these two slides is that when enabling control technology is introduced, Peak demand reductions increase for the two rate designs, critical peak pricing and critical peak rebates, and their differences virtually disappear. Therefore, regulators working with smart rates in their states should consider the upward potential of enabling control technologies. Next. RAT received a pre-conference question concerning consumer protection. As a former consumer advocate, I would be remiss if I did not address the subject of consumer protections. This and the next slide highlight several protections like shadow billing and first year whole harmless provisions that should be considered by regulators when rolling out smart rates. Next. These consumer protections represent the heart in smart rate design and should provide a soft landing for consumers. Next. Changing the subject, regulators should consider implementing integrated distribution grid planning, which is analogous to integrated resource planning, IRP, on the distribution system. Strategically located distributive generation, demand response, and energy efficiency can be more cheaply deployed than some utility distribution system upgrades, such as reconductoring or getting new or upgraded substations. And this planning process is being pioneered in California and New York. Next. Concerning distributive energy resources, rate design should incorporate these three elements. Locational pricing or credits can attract strategically located distribution energy resources. Also, a smart, a smart inverter on a rooftop PV system can provide voltage support and frequency control as ancillary services. However, if electricity pricing does not recognize these attributes, then PV solar customers will not install this higher cost inverter, making the solar 
installation suboptimal. Next. With this slide, I want to tee up the paper's pragmatic approach to net metering. On the next slide, there's Jim Hinter there. Our net metering approach emphasizes simple compensation and interconnection, close enough compensation at smaller descriptive generation penetration, and more rigorous compensation formulas for higher penetrations and higher cost utilities. Next. This table represents, uh, this table separates utilities into three cost categories and makes net metering recommendations based on a range of value of solar studies. For low cost utilities, those below 10 cents a kilowatt hour, traditional net meter metering undercompensates EG customers. For average cost utilities, ranging from 10 to 20 cents a kilowatt hour, traditional net metering provides rough justice. And for high cost utilities, those with rates greater than 20 cents a kilowatt hour, EG customers are overly compensated by traditional net metering and instead should pay the retail rate for KWA to consume and receive just power supply costs, no distribution for the power that is produced. Next. I wanted to state that you know, PV customers are for the most part being unfairly characterized as being subsidized by other customers. This is especially true given the dynamic nature of cost allocations amongst customers and customer classes. Also, remember the full scope of PV benefits highlighted earlier in Jim's presentation. Next. For utilities present in the audience, this slide addresses a topic that is near and dear to the utility financial officer. The handling of utility revenue deficiency through the distributed energy resources, such as distributed generation energy efficiency and demand response. The paper presents three options. One, revenue decoupling mechanisms that are being used in about half the state and address sales variations. Number two, performance-based rate making, or what's called incentive regulation, where a regulator sets targets, be it for energy efficiency, cost reduction, reliability, customer satisfaction, etc., and the utility gets rewarded for meeting set targets. Finally, a regulator can entertain rate of return adjustments to compensate the utility for additional risk. Next. In summary, the following regulatory policies support a smart future. Time differentiated rates, revenue regulation, next. Other complementary policies are upgrading state building codes and federal appliance standards in the area of automated controls, as well as creating a market for smart inverters. We have defined a not-so-smart future as containing non-time differentiated rates, straight fixed variable rate designs, or discriminatory charges to distributed generation customers. In closing, what the paper has outlined is achievable. The path to the smart future, however, will require courage on the part of all utility stakeholders. With this, I conclude my presentation and thank you. Thank you, Wilson. Um, we have a clarifying question, which is, could you explain what shadow billing is? Okay. Shadow billing is when a customer gets a bill. So a one form of shadow billing is that when a customer gets a bill and they're on a smart rate, they see the bill calculated in a simple manner that shows what their bill is using the smart rate, the rate they're on. But it also shows the bill, the bill cost if they had been on their original rate or their default rate or, or whatever rate they were on before. So the customer gets to, to compare and gets to 
experiment with modifying these loads in some cases and educating themselves so that they can see how their actions uh, impact their bill. So it's, it's, a, it's a very important educational tool to, to get customers to understand uh, more closely the rate designs that they're under. Thank you. Um, and, in, and in some, and I'll add to that, that in some circumstances, folks advocate that you show both bills, the standard rate plus the smart rate, and that the customer for the first year get the lower of the two rates, and that gives them the opportunity to get on the program and then also compare their rates and determine whether the smart rate would be beneficial to them. I'm going to move to um, another question that goes to Jim. Why do fixed sunk costs need to be recovered with fixed demand charges? If customer's peak does not match the grid peak, why pay a dollar per kW charge? Well, I'm going to ask, answer that in, in two parts. We don't think that fixed costs should be reflected in fixed charges. That's not how they're reflected in uh, <clears throat> the examples I used of the uh, oil industry or the airline industry or the hotel industry. The reason that enterprises exist is to make investments and to recover those costs by selling the product that they produce. So for almost all of the fixed costs of an electric utility, uh, our paper concludes that a time differentiated energy charge is the best way to recover it. The exception, the possible exception, is those distribution components that are sized to the individual customer's need. In this case, the final line transformer, if you will, the garbage can hanging on the pole outside of your house. Those have to be sized to the loads of the individual, of the customers that are connected to it. It may be one customer uh, in a rural area. It may be half a dozen customers in a suburban area. In an apartment context, it could be uh, more than 100 customers. But those have to be sized to the very localized peak. And so we proposed a demand charge to recover that cost and that cost alone. So that, for example, the solar customer who on net uses no kilowatt hours is still paying for the cost of the transformer that has to be there to serve them, even though the rest of the grid uh, is serving other customers and is sized to the combined loads uh, and the power that the solar customer may be submitting to the grid through the transformer only goes as far as their next door neighbor. It doesn't use much in the way of grid services. But the transformer does have to be sized to the individual or, or neighborhood customer loads. And so we allowed that a demand charge was reasonable for that cost and that cost alone. Thank you. Another uh, question, which is, is somewhat of a clarifying question, is are you advocating a rate design with demand charges for residential customers? Only to recover the final line transformer cost, not to recover poles and wires and substations on the distribution system, and not to recover generation or transmission costs. All of those costs would be reflected uh, only in the time differentiated energy charges. OK, thank you. Um, how should we balance the need for uh, low rates with the need for investments to accommodate growing renewables and distributed generation? Wilson? I think Wilson, Wilson. may be muted. Uh, Jim, do you want to take that question then? Uh, <clears throat> let, let me just clearly go, go ahead. Keep back. Go ahead no, go ahead, Wilson. Yeah, no, no, I was just going to say that, that we have uh, the process I introduced in one of my slides and what they're experimenting with in both California and the, both California and New York is, you know, through integrated distribution planning, we can ex enhance the distribution planning function so that it becomes more of a least cost process so that it, in that sense, strategically locating distributed generation and other resources like demand response and energy efficiency to help lower costs uh, for everyone. 
Our paper has a bit of substantial section that addresses the cost savings from smart grid investments, and these go far beyond automated meter reading. Uh, they include things like peak load reduction, line loss reduction, uh, avoidance of uh, new generation and transmission capacity costs, uh, and most of the studies that have been done show that the long-run savings from these investments exceeds the cost, so they should be reducing customer bills. Uh, and the paper talks at some length about how regulators should uh, insist on good documentation uh, when including smart grid investments into rates for the first time to make sure that the costs and the benefits are reflected simultaneously. Okay. Another question. We have uh, many questions, so I thank all the uh, viewers for all your questions. Another question is solar. I'm sorry. Um, okay. Solar is the only generate is the only generation part of the rate. Is only the excuse me. Solar is only the generation part of the rate, but you seem to be comparing it to the full retail rate and saying the studies are in the right ballpark. Is it the right ballpark when you add distribution and transmission? Uh, we think it generally is for most average cost utilities. That is, what you're comparing is a premium resource, a renewable resource with good emissions characteristics. That's local has fuel cost of risk avoidance, fuel cost avoidance, uh, uh, fuel supply risk avoidance. It's got a lot of characteristics that grid power does not have. Uh, and those additional values are roughly equal to the, uh, uh, the grid costs that are included in the traditional rate. The balance scale that I, I went through at the end of my presentation kind of addressed that. But as Wilson's, our slide 42 uh, uh, explains, for the high cost utilities, uh, the premium value of the new renewable and local generation may not uh, take place then. Uh, for the high cost utility, that pre those, those premium values may not be enough to, to roughly equal the distribution cost. And for those high cost utilities, and here I'm thinking perhaps of uh, some of the New England utilities, the Hawaii utilities, Puerto Rico, Guam, uh, the, uh, uh, in, in that situation it may be that a power supply only credit would be appropriate. Uh, but it's important not to ignore the uh, the attributes of the solar resource in valuing it. They, a full value of solar study that looks at all of these values uh, is a very good tool. And when solar saturation gets high, you know, over maybe three or four or five percent, it's probably beneficial for the regulator to insist on that. Maine, uh, Minnesota, uh, California, Austin, Texas have done value of solar studies and they do show consistently that the solar resource has more value than the conventional grid power supply resource. And I think this also answers another question regarding avoided emissions and avoided RPF costs which would be included in your um, balanced approach on that slide. So. Um, I, there is also a question here. You raised the value of solar, and there is a question um, with regard to how to show the value to solar net me of solar net metering and time of use critical peak pricing and or dynamic pricing. How would you show that value? Well, I mean, the, the ultimately on the bill, one would simply show that value in the simplest manner possible uh, with prices that customers can understand. Uh, you know, and, and the illustrative rate design uh, that I showed at the very beginning of my presentation attempts to do that. Uh, in terms of the, the calculating that value, there are the three uh, studies that I mentioned, the E3 study for California, the and the studies that were done for the Minnesota and Maine Commission uh, 
go into very detailed methodologies for valuation of each of those components and that they build up the layer cake of values. The study for the state of Maine may be the best of them because it separates out very clearly the utility system values and the societal values and the societal values are much greater than the utility system values. Following up on that question, another questioner asks, does time of demand or supply of solar and grid electricity alter the conclusion that the val that value of solar is approximately equal to retail re electricity? It might over time as solar uh, penetration increases. Uh, in, in very high solar regions, and I'm thinking of Germany and Hawaii in particular, uh, they've reached a point where daytime uh, marginal costs are lower uh, than evening marginal costs. That is, there's so much solar on the system in the middle of the day that it becomes an off-peak period. That doesn't actually change our rate design recommendations, that there should be an off-peak, mid-peak, and on-peak price. It may mean that the off-peak price includes 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., a period that's in the past been thought of as part of the daytime peak period. Uh, that might become off-peak in a high solar environment. If the solar customer is taking power during the on-peak period of 5 to 9 p.m. and delivering power during an off-peak period of 10 to 2 p.m., they might wind up, even though their net kilowatt hours come out to zero, they might wind up with a pretty substantial electric bill if what they're providing to the utility is low value power and what they're receiving from the utility is high value power. Thank you, Jim. Wilson, um, of all the dynamic rates, which one do you think is the best rate for a future with EV, smart appliances, and distributed generation? Well, I, I would say I have a preference for a, a combination of of a time of use rate with a critical peak pricing rate. And I think that's the rate that uh, Jim uh, demonstrated in, his, in one of his slides. Because I think it gives, uh, it gives both uh, customers uh, are able to save on the off-peak period. And it also responds to system events in a dynamic nature, which a time of use rate by itself would not do. So it, combining the best attributes of both types of rate design. Yeah, Deb, if you can go to slide 33, I think that's the, uh, the one that uh, uh, shows the graphic out of our, uh, at our, our time varying, this is a, a graphic out of a RAP publication on time varying and dynamic rates, uh, where they looked at a lot of different at different pilots and what they found was that the critical peak pricing rate provided more savings than the peak time rebate or simple time of use rates, but also showed, and Wilson focused on this in his presentation, that adding the technology enhancement, the automatic load controllers, uh, dramatically improves the performance of all three types of rate designs. Time of use with technology works better than time of use. Peak time rebate with technology works better than simple peak time rebate, and the critical peak pricing with technology across these pilots seem to have the most beneficial results for the consumers in terms of cost savings. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to switch gears a little bit and go to another question that it asks, to please address cost shifting from customers who install distributed generation to others. Please address revenue losses from distributed generation. Uh, there's two different kinds of, of revenue losses that can occur from distributed resources. One is the customer simply taking less power from the utility, and the utility recovers less distribution costs. That function is really no different uh, from a customer installing energy efficiency, and most regulators have uh, taken the position over time in both gas and electric industry that in the next rate case or in the next rate adjustment those uh, costs will be uh, traded as system costs. They may be picked up by load growth of other customers, 
uh, because there's growing loads at the same time that, that there may be some shrinking loads. The other category of, of revenue losses from uh, distributed generation is those customers feeding power into the system and receiving a retail rate credit while in the short run the utility is only avoiding a short run marginal cost and that's where the value of solar study comes in what is the utility avoiding in the long run uh, and so there may be a, a if there's a mismatch between the short run avoided costs and the long run avoided costs there may be a uh, uh, a, a temporary revenue impact. The first recommendation of the paper is that that revenue loss be addressed through a revenue regulation mechanism uh, uh, so that those costs are ultimately uh, not lost to the utility. Uh, but a big part of this paper focuses on the, I think, flawed logic that the question seems to imply. That is that uh, if the utilities rates is six cents for generation and four cents for distribution and the, the solar customer gets 10 cents of credit, that there's four cents of distribution costs that are being not paid by, by that customer, that there's that loss. But that fails to recognize the the superior economic value of the new clean resources being supplied compared to the uh, older existing uh, probably dirtier resource that's embedded in that six cent generation price. Uh, uh, we, the paper focuses very clearly on uh, keeping an eye on, on long run values, not short run values. There is a related question about how much value does DG provide to the distribution system based on its time of generation? How does it, how does it provide that value? Uh, well, this, it varies. There are, you know, I mean, for example, there are winter systems that are winter peaking systems that have their peak loads at 7 a.m. in January. And a solar system is not going to provide any distribution system benefit. Uh, uh, to that uh, peaking requirement on the distribution system. For most utilities in the U.S. with summer peaking, the studies so far show that there are significant peak load reductions, significant line loss reductions, uh, and uh, uh, sub sub substantial capacity savings on the distribution system uh, from solar. However, uh, in places like Hawaii and in Germany, where the solar systems are so prevalent, you know, with over 20% of single family homes in Hawaii now having solar systems, there are circuits where, uh, that are maybe running backwards in the middle of the day. Uh, at, at saturation levels uh, reaching into the double digits, those capacity benefits can become very different, and the and one of the reasons the paper says that when your saturation gets high, you need a fairly disciplined value of solar study to value the resource. Okay, thank you. Um, we, we we keep getting more questions added on, so we have quite a few still. So um, another question and. Um, is, and I'm kind of skipping around a little bit so that we make sure we cover the, the range of what this presentation was like, was um, dealing with, so that everybody gets some areas of questions answered. So um, there's a method here. So the next question is, please describe the investment approach a utility should use to modernize while revenues are declining. I, this is Wilson. I would say a very cautious a very cautious approach to investment. And I think, you know, the market will probably tell them that anyway. Uh, that's why one of the recommendations we make in the paper is for grid services, you, sh you should have an uh, analogous process to integrate resource planning so that you make sure the investments you make are the least cost, probably modular in, in size, and, and to see, you know, how the future of the system is going to is going to go forward. So I, I think that that would be the message of the paper in terms of of investments. 
this expand the process for determining what uh, what investments are made on the grid. You know, traditionally, distribution planning was basically you know an engineering exercise looking at looking at the different components. You know, uh, uh, the, the lines, the transformers, you know, and, and, and so on. And other options were not not considered. And I, and I think there's been some you know, examples where you know, demand response has been used, or energy efficiency has been used to help postpone or completely defer distribution updates. Yeah, Wilson makes a very important point, which is if there's a peak load requirement that only ex extends for a few hours a year, clearly a demand response resource is going to be the economical resource. And that doesn't involve any substantial investment by the by the utility. If the expected capacity requirement extends over hundreds or thousands of hours, uh, then the comparison between attracting a distributed resource into that node of the service territory or upgrading the capacity of the distribution may be the attractive option. Uh, with respect to installing smart meters and meter data management systems, so, you know, there's very few dumb meters being produced or sold today because the incremental costs are very small. So as meters are being replaced, they should be replaced with smart meters. Uh, even if they're not going to be used, even if the capabilities of those meters aren't going to be used for three or five years into the future because you don't want to install new dumb meters. Uh, but you may not want to do a blanket installation of smart meters and replace perfectly good electromechanical meters until you're ready to move ahead with a meter data management system and uh, advanced uh, billing engine and smart pricing. Thank you, Jim. I, I would and just, we're going to take... Oh, go ahead, Wilson. No, I just wanted to add that, you know, the, the implication in the question is that if you make these large investments and customers abandon the grid because of certain rate designs or whatever, you know, regulators are going to be faced with a big, a bigger stranded cost issue. So that's what we're trying to mitigate and balance. Okay, we have time for one more question and then we're going to um, do the wrap up. But I'd like to let folks know that because there are so many other questions, we, uh, we will stay on the line for another half hour after this call officially terminates. So for people who have more time and would like to stay on or haven't had their questions asked, um, answered, please do feel free to stay on. So I'm going to do one more question, then we're going to switch to Jim for the wrap-up. And the question is, utilities are increasingly seeing a need for adding flexible generation capability as a result of increased intermittent generation from PV. Shouldn't the PV customer pay his share of the service? A zero bill PV customer wouldn't contribute to that. Who would like to take that? Janine, Jim is having to dial back into the session. He'll be with us shortly. So, Wilson, could you possibly handle that question? Yeah, can you repeat the, the, the question briefly? Hello? Yes. Yeah, can you repeat the question briefly? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, utilities are increasingly seeing a need for adding flexible generation capability as a result of increased intermittent generation from PV. Shouldn't the PV customer pay his share of this service? A zero bill PV customer wouldn't contribute to that. Well, that's a good question. I mean, first we would have to see what the what the new uh, what the new equipment costs, for example, more flexible gas turbines or combined cycle gas units that can respond to load, and uh, and and see what what exactly the increased cost is. Uh, the the one thing is I know that in terms of variable resources, there is a system integration charge, which, you know, had run in the past from anywhere from 0.3 cents to 0.7 or 8 cents per kilowatt hour that gets uh, that gets uh, added to 
to the cost to accommodate perhaps variable uh, generation. However, you know, there are other costs and there are other benefits that the generation, uh, for example, the a, a wind a wind resources, you know, is a, is a good energy resource when it's running and it backs down dirtier power plants and it's, it sometimes can have even a negative cost. So I, I think the way the system works where there's a lot of averaging and there's a lot of uh, 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 combinations that are put together, I, I, I think that the treatment has been that it washes out at the end. And obviously it depends on the amount of, of, of uh, the renewable resources that, that is being uh, developed and implemented. And I, I would also add to that that RAP has done a publication, Teaching the Duck to Fly, which talks about intermittent resources, demand response, and a whole bunch of other tools that are available to address the intermittency problem in a very cost-effective um, manner. And that paper was also authored by Jim Lazar, who is back online and can um, give us our, the concluding uh, remarks. Jim? Jim? Okay. Well, we thought Jim was back online. I guess he's still experiencing some technical Jim, difficulties. Jim, am I being heard? Yeah, go ahead. You're good. Okay, good. Uh, this uh, presentation and this paper uh, have a few real key elements. Uh, first, three the three guiding principles. The customer should be able to connect to the grid for no more than the cost of connecting to the grid. They should pay for uh, uh, power supply and grid services in proportion to how much they use and when they use it. And the customers that supply power to the grid should receive full and fair compensation, no more and no less. Second, that high fixed charges uh, are generally improper in utility rates. It's inconsistent with the principles under which electric utility regulation was created more than 100 years ago to impose on utilities the pricing discipline that the market imposes on competitive industries. Third, that time varying pricing is desirable. And the time periods will vary from region to region and vary from utility to utility, and they will vary over time. But the, the costs of power supply and grid services should be recovered in those time varying prices. Fourth, that technology enhancement is important. Uh, that automated controls, smart thermostats, smart refrigerators, uh, the four and six hour delay button on my new dishwasher are important tools to enable customers to respond easily and painlessly uh, to, uh, to smart pricing. Fifth, that the value of solar may be greater than or less than retailers. And for low cost utilities in particular, the value of solar may well exceed retail rates. Uh, for high cost utilities, it may be the opposite. But the value of solar needs to be computed, looking at the value of a new resource, a clean resource, a resource that's delivered at the distribution level and that avoids uh, emission costs and fuel cost risk and fuel supply risk. Uh, six, the distributed generation customers can provide grid services. Uh, electric vehicles can be uh, charged intermittently. Uh, solar systems can be installed with smart inverters that can provide ancillary services to the utility. And pricing needs to take those potentials into account. And finally, that consumer protections are very important. Things like shadow billing, good consumer education, helping customers select the right rate schedule if there are optional rate schedules are all very important elements of the transition from our past uh, rate design practices to the rate designs that will help us with a brighter future. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. And for anyone who wants to stay on the line, we will stay on for an additional 30 minutes. 
um, or until we run out of questions if that comes earlier. Um, so I'm going to proceed now with another question. And um, for those that have to get off the line, I want to thank you very much for having uh, attended our webinar and uh, stay tuned and keep posted for future RAP webinars for which there will be many. Thank you. Okay, another question that we got was, um, are there today already examples of time of use tariffs for residential customers? Are metering costs not higher than benefits? Yeah, this, this, uh, this question, I would answer this question, yes. And, you know, get your time of use tariffs. Usually they're optional, and usually they start as pilot programs, but with the deployment of smart grid and smart grid technology, smart meters, uh, some utilities have been very successful at, at uh, examples of time, you know, of having successful time of use programs. So I, the paper does give a certain uh, a number of utilities uh, programs and results that people are consider. The the issue of whether metering costs is higher than benefits. I would say traditionally that was the issue that kept at least residential customers from having time of use or cost effective time of, time of use available to them. Because the metering costs were very high. And technically if you have a, a deployment of smart meters, you get the volume pricing discounts. And like Jim said earlier, the pricing for digital meters ha has come down significantly. So while that may have been the case in the past, I, I think in the smart future and in the current uh, state of affairs we're in today, I, I don't think that's the case anymore. Thank you. There are a number of utilities that have been rolling out uh, default time of use pricing, uh, and uh, quite a few of them are doing so without without a rate increase. That is, that they've managed to replace their their existing meters and implement a meter data management system without a net cost increase. Now, some of that may be that those were utilities that that. Uh, uh, stimulus program grants that paid for a substantial part of the cost. Uh, but the costs have continued to come down and the industry experience with uh, getting these systems up and running uh, has now been uh, addressed by those pioneer utilities. And I think we will see uh, pretty low incremental costs uh, uh, of these systems. And then, but the key is for the regulators to insist that the utilities pursue the cost savings that can come with these. That is, the manned response programs that allow customers to save substantially uh, when they help the utility avoid extreme peaks. Uh, using the, the smart grid systems to reduce uh, the, the, the phase balancing and other forms of line loss reduction that will reduce costs. Uh, if the utility simply uses that smart meter and meter data management system to send bills, uh, we're not going to achieve the uh, the cost savings that will help hold customer bills down. Thank you, Jim. Next question: Are new tools required to ensure that utility investments in T and D are prudently incurred when better alternatives exist? Yeah, I, I would say somewhat new tools, but really a new process. And that's what we were trying to get at in the paper when we talked a little bit about integrated distribution planning. And I would extend that to transmission planning process. I know, I know for it, so for example, even in the transmission where you have regional transmission organizations, there's been a push by stakeholders to incorporate uh, non-traditional transmission uh, investments into the planning process. So for example, you know, how do how do how does energy efficiency or demand response resources, especially those that are strategically located, help avoid, you know, a, a very costly uh, interstate transmission line. So those are those are the, the types of processes that we're trying to incorporate. And each of the processes in turn will have and develop tools to do the comparison, you know, on a on a level playing field basis. Thank you, Wilson. 
Next question is, what percentage of utilities use the basic customer method, lowest customer charge method, um, to design the fixed customer charge? Why is this method the best method for the future customer charges? Jim? Uh, you know, I haven't seen any recent survey on this. The survey that the National Regulatory Research Institute did uh, many years ago that showed Something like 31, 32 states regulators were requiring the use of the basic customer method, uh, and the others were allowing either multiple methods to be used or a different method to be used, or I think in one case, no method for cost of service method was being used at all. Uh, looking ahead, the reason that it's the approach is that it best reflects the incremental cost that a utility incurs if then the customer is added to the system. That is, if I divide my house into a duplex by turning my basement into a, an apartment, uh, or the costs that are avoided when a customer leaves the system. That is, if, if I decide to uh, give a test battery my business and disconnect from the utility. Uh, we're seeing a lot of grid defection uh, already on many utility systems of low-use customers. And the uh, paper talks about this. The, the, the poster child of this is the LED school crossing light that where more than 100,000 have been installed around the country. School crossing lights used to require a grid connection, but it's now become cost-effective to install a solar panel and battery to operate them in order to avoid the, the cost of the grid connection. Now, it's not the one or two kilowatt hours a month that the systems use that is expensive. It's the monthly fixed charge that the utility cost imposes on, uh, I, uh, on, on that connection. And so while the power lines may be running immediately above uh, these pedestrian cross signals, customers are choosing disconnect. If it's cost effective today for a two kilowatt hour a month customer, the rate costs are coming down, soon it will be the 200 kilowatt hour a month customer that will find it cost effective to defect from the grid uh, if high fixed charges are allowed and imposed. Thank you. And another follow-up question on on this issue is, can you speak to how fixed, and we have two questions on this. Can you speak to how fixed charges affect customers' energy-related behaviors? Is there evidence that shows how people respond to these charges? Uh, high fixed charges have one effect. That is, customers will be less likely to be customers or more likely to consolidate their services. That is, you may have a house with a uh, accessory dwelling unit apartment Uh, and the utility loses customers. On the other side of the equation, though, the higher fixed charge means a lower per kilowatt hour charge, given any particular revenue requirement. And there is a great deal of evidence that customers do respond to the price per kilowatt hour. And in one of our publications, uh, uh, rate design where advanced metering infrastructure has not been fully deployed, we have an appendix that takes the reader through the uh, elasticity calculation. And that paper shows that the difference between a uh, progressive rate design and a high fixed charge rate design can be as much as a 15% change in the amount of usage per customer, or enough to wipe out an entire decade of energy, effic energy efficiency achievements. OK, thanks. Thank you. And we have one other question on this to uh, topic about what about including associated overhead costs in customer charges? Well, I, I guess if those are incremental costs of serving an additional customer, then uh, they are customer specific. If they are overhead costs of the overall utility, for example, insurance or, or employee health benefits for the the, the, the company executives uh, or, or the distribution employees, then those are not incremental costs of serving an additional customer and they don't belong in a fixed charge. Okay. 
Thank you. And another question that we have is, um, what is the most important consideration to make for low-income customers when implementing um, ch these changes in rates? Well, I, I had a slide that dealt with some of the consumer protections, you know, generally, and, and obviously we're just talking about rate design. In our paper, we do have a section that also addresses the, there's an operational benefit when you install smart meters that you can, it's cheaper and almost automatic to shut off and uh, disconnect and reconnect the customer. So the benefit of a quick reconnection is very valuable, but there is some concern, uh, rightly so, that the uh, consumer protections that exist, you know, may be violated because, you know, in trying to balance the operational savings, i.e. the lower cost of performing a disconnection with the existing protections of notification. So we do have a, a section in the, in the paper that deals with that particular issue, but I, I think the, generally the the five or six points that we talk about in the paper, I, I think, is a starting point for how to deal with you know, uh, at-risk populations. And we also state that you know that a lot a lot of states also have safety nets for customers who are at risk, and, and such as rate discounts. Uh, percentage of income payment programs, user space discounts, and so on. So I, I think that you know it's 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 the rate design and how you how you how you approach it is very important. But there, there are also other protections. The, the, the final thing I would say is that there are a number of pilots that have demonstrated that low income customers have saved money and have uh, benefited from the programs. And I know in uh, a favorite of some consumer advocates is a, a peak time rebate program for low income customers because there's no risk to the customer and there's, there's a reward if, if they're educated and they're able to uh, manage some of their loads uh, during peak events. So that, that would be my, my response to that question. Thank you, Wilson. This is a long question, so um, for well, either I, of you. Janine, I'd like to jump in on, on the low-income Oh, please portion. do. I, I, please I do. lost audio for, for, for a moment there. Uh, there is a lot of evidence that low-income customers have lower usage than, uh, than average and higher-income consumers. Uh, there's Within that evidence, that, 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 that evidence is very clear, which means that high fixed charges are very detrimental to low-income consumers. Uh, the issue of whether time varying rates are beneficial or detrimental uh, is a little more complex. There is a little bit of evidence that because low-income consumers have less of their usage represented by air conditioning, that they are less peak-oriented and therefore would generally benefit from time varying rates but there unquestionably is a spectrum of usage characteristics of low-income customers. And as with any change in rates, some of them will be worse off as a result of, uh, of, of time varying rates. But I believe the majority will benefit. Uh, but there's, I think, some very important research to be done on that question. It's been very limited data so far. Thank you, Jim. Okay, here is um, a longer question. If you advocate adoption of time differentiated rates to recover fixed costs, why use the traditional time of use blocks, i.e. off-peak shoulder and peak periods? Why not move to pure energy markets with the periods defined as 1, 5, 10, or 15 minutes, depending on the metering technology. Or using your logic, what justification do capacity markets have? It seems that the Alberta and ERCOT markets are way ahead of other regions, right? Uh, I'll give a very simple response to a complex question. Customer understanding. 
I think that customers, we've, we've learned that customers can understand and constructively respond to a three period rate with a critical peak pricing element. There have been dozens of pilot programs in that regard. There is very, very limited experience with true dynamic pricing for residential customers. Uh, I think it works fine for large industrial customers where there's a full-time energy manager, uh, but customer understanding, I think, is an, an ability to respond is the reason to use uh, uh, predefined time periods that customers can, can plan for. Um, another question. Um, another question we have is, as the smarter system develops, won't the rate design um, become outdated? How should rate design be incorporated into uh, integrated resource planning? Wilson, do you yeah, want to respond yeah. to that? Yeah, let me take a crack at it. I think, you know, rate design is evolving. I mean, we have the three principles that were set out in the paper, which should carry, carry us a long way. But, you know, rate design is, is different. And the example that Jim talked about in terms of systems who load shape has completely changed, you know, over a very short period of time. And the rate design should be flexible. At least the principles are definitely flexible enough. And the rate design based on a time of use uh, perspective, you know, will adapt, will adapt. So for, I think there was a question earlier about what about, uh, I think it was a, a pre-conference question, what about systems that are winter peaking? Does the time, does the time of use, you know, make sense in that particular case, especially around heating, which is such an important end use? And, you know, I would argue that time differentiated rates will will work. It'll it'll develop, it'll lead to the development of heat storing technologies, maybe more zonal heating controls, better humidity controls. Given that with a little higher humidity, you can uh, you feel warmer. You can, you can start incorporating passive solar techniques from the 70s in, into this types of uh, uh, facilities, and, and you know people can start looking at dual fuel. Capability if the price discounts are, are, are sufficient to warrant that investment. So I would say that that upon, I think the principles and the basic premise of you know charging what the rates cost over time is is a pretty strong principle in terms of integrating it with uh, integrated resource planning. Some systems already have you know the prior to the decrease in costs in, in, in smart metering and, and smart grid in general, you know, it, it really wasn't integrated into, you know, the heyday of integrated resource planning, you know, in the 80s and 90s and so on. But I, as more of these systems get deployed, and especially deployed over wide regions, time of use savings can be integrated easily into a, a uh, uh, integrated resource system as, as, a, as an avoided cost. And in fact, I would say, in, for example, for companies in the, in the PJM footprint, and also for ISO New England, they accept, in their capacity markets, they accept savings that are documented from uh, smart rates. So those savings that are documented, and there's been a a lot of study, a lot of uh, verification and measurement of verification studies and so on that will be acceptable to the regional transmission organization in their capacity markets and, and they will be remunerated for every kilowatt hour that is saved. So, so I, I, think, I think it's natural that uh, smart rate designs and, and uh, smart rates get incorporated into uh, integrated resource planning process. Let me give an example of a utility that's doing something with their smart meter data that goes completely outside of the realm of customer billing and pricing. Uh, the city of Burbank, California has a 50,000 customer municipal electric utility. They implemented a program called Smart Saver, which integrates the data 
from their GIS system on which customers are connected to which transformer with the data from their meter data management system that gives them interval data for every meter. And with that, they're able to calculate the 15 minute interval loads for each transformer on the system. Last year in the spring, they implemented this program and identified about 50 transformers that were significantly overloaded to the point that they could be at risk of failure. And they went out and replaced 49 of them. One of them turned out to have already been replaced and the data in the GIS system was incorrect. They got through the summer, including a very long extended hot spell with no transformer failures. The adjacent utility in Glendale and Pasadena with very similar systems, similar weather, uh, experienced significant customer failures. So their investment in, in their, their smart grid allowed them to uh, improve reliability, which is certainly valuable to customers, but also resulted in substantial uh, line loss savings by uh, first identifying the overloaded transformers that were having very high losses uh, because they were overloaded. And then they went back and identified underloaded transformers uh, that had too high a standby loss and replaced them with smaller transformers that were more appropriately sized. This is using the data from, from the smart grid investment to provide tangible economic valuable value to the customers, entirely separate from the metering and billing function. Thank you, Jim. Another question that we have is, does a, does a dynamic rate with TOU rates, PPR, et cetera, should it be directly, is it directly related to a dynamic, or should it be directly related to a dynamic or fast response electric system? Well, I think that the critical peak pricing element should be directly related to both the the short-term market costs and the dynamic impacts on on the utility system. If there's a major generation or transmission failure, the utility uh, perhaps should uh, call a critical peak event on those customers that have agreed to, uh, for, you know, that are able to provide immediate response. Uh, uh, so the critical peak pricing element, I think, should be very dynamic. The, the balance of it should be uh, changed in a very careful fashion to an, ensure customer understanding. Okay. And um, are there specific considerations when the area you serve does not have an AC load and the peak is in December or January at 7 p.m.? Yes. That's a, that's a very different situation with respect to the capacity value of solar. Uh, and, but it may depend upon the, the generation value of solar may depend on what that utility is interconnected to. Uh, I live in Olympia, Washington. We are a winter peaking system, but our power supply is so thoroughly integrated to California with about 8,000 megawatts of transfer capacity that the wholesale power market is a summer afternoon peaking market still. And so the generation value of solar is still very high in the summer, but the distribution capacity value is uh, approximately zero. Okay. Um, there was a, um, there was a follow-up question on the ERCOT question. Um, which says um, the cost allocation on the basis of energy does not mean the pricing that the pricing is complex. Um, and for example, the Texas example where you might have three nights, you know, three nights and weekends, or various kind of pricing schemes, um, which are much simpler than traditional time of use rate, time of use rates. Sort of a comment here. Any follow-up uh, from either of you well, on that? I think the best way to present time of use rates to, to consumers is, uh, is an, an area that welcomes uh, investigation and evaluation. Uh, we presented sort of a, the, the most traditional approach of a three-period time of use rate plus critical period pricing. But some of, the, some of the efforts that are being attempted in other places, whether it's uh, you know, free nights and weekends or some other approach 
may in fact communicate better to customers and produce uh, equal or better results and only evaluation will tell us that. I, I wanted to add too that if in the paper that one of the appendices, I believe it's appendix C, looks at deregulated states and it looks at states that have retail competition such as Texas. So I, I think we tried to take a look at that and, and see how rate designs and how customer choice states can benefit from uh, uh, smart uh, meters and, and smart rates. But just wanted to add that point. Okay, we have time for maybe two more questions. So one question is, isn't the trend to radically increase fixed price and drop variable costs per KWH more simply uh, speaking to a strategy to hold, um, uh, speaking a strategy to hold on to an increased sale? Uh, I, I think the main thing that's driving it is a desire to stabilize revenues. And uh, the paper describes other ways to stabilize revenues that can have the same uh, benefit for utilities and their, uh, and their, and their investors. Uh, but clearly there, you know, there, there's a great deal of uh, methodology being ascribed to this, you know, the, 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 the language that fixed costs should be reflected in fixed charges uh, sounds logical. Uh, it happens to have essentially no no equivalent in the competitive world uh, where fixed costs of every kind of establishment are recovered in, their, in, in unit prices. Uh, when we go to Home Depot, we connect to a worldwide hardware grid and we pay for each item at the register. When we go to the supermarket, we connect to a worldwide food grid and we pay for each item at the register. And all of the costs of the hardware and the food grid are built into those prices. Uh, but I think the real focus is on uh, uh, stabilizing revenues in a situation where sales may be declining and revenue regulation or decoupling is another way of accomplishing uh, that same goal. Uh, and uh, the paper talks about that and REP has a number of publications uh, that are referenced in the paper on that subject. Okay, one um, final question. If distributed generation does not alter the customer's peak, then there is no um, difference in what they pay on KVA charges? Uh, in the rate design that we have proposed, the line transformer charge, that $1 per KVA, would not be affected uh, if the customer's distributed generation does not change their that customer's uh, uh, maximum load, uh, either direction on, on the system. OK. Um, actually, we have time for one other question. And uh, that question is, please comment on how fixed charges contribute or not to rate designs, which in sense transit a grid capable of responding. Presumably to price signals. The, the the main effect of fixed charges is to suppress the per kilowatt hour charge, which will have the effect of increasing uh, customer usage, uh, causing customers to be less likely to invest in efficiency, less likely to turn off the lights when they leave the room, less likely to control the thermostat, uh, particularly uh, uh, if, if a very large part of the revenue requirement is included in the fixed charge. Okay, well, well, thank you, Jim. And I want to thank all the attendees for your interest in today's webinar. A recording of the webinar, along with the speakers' presentations, will be available on RAP's website and will also be sent to you by email tomorrow. So stay tuned for that. And thank you once again, and um, we appreciate your interest in this topic. Have a good afternoon. Bye.